Well, hello. Welcome to the show. I'm Rochelle Emerson. If you've been here before, welcome back. And if not, welcome. <laughs> anyway, today we're going to be, uh, and I thought it was an interesting thing to talk about. And just, you know, some deep thought on it is uh, all of a sudden during the, the DNC convention, all of them are repeating joy, joy. Even the, the pundits, the, the, the PSNBCs, the CNN, all of them, all of them. The joy in the air, the joy, like all of them repeating the same thing. It's, I think they, they, they got together and they, sh they shot out an email. All right. Everybody is going to say joy. Throughout all their broadcasts. <laughs> it cracks me up because they do it they do it all the time. It was like remember when when they were saying that uh uh JD Vance was weird and and the uh, D, uh the RNC's uh stomping they're, they're just weird. They're just weird. And then there was this montage of all of them. All of them, every one of them. I don't care what channel you went to. They were all saying it's weird. Like I said, they somebody's got them on, you know, <laughs> a quick message, boom, just say it, say they're weird. Just, just, just say they're all weird. It just cracks me up that, that they send out these talking points and they all repeat the same thing. It's like, what, can't they just report and give their own whatever? Most of the news now is just commentary. You know, I mean, they're not reporting the news. They're, they're uh, not commentary. The opinion, opinion reporting, and they don't have their own opinion. They they've got to they got to fall into this 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 thing. So they all send out all these things. Now, the reason why I'm bringing it up because they're all saying joy, and it's interesting. So let's take let's take uh, the Nazis. So remember when when they all came out, uh, all the all the news left wing libtards come out, and they were all saying Trump was a dictator, Trump's a Nazi, Trump is wants to just stay in power, and all of this silliness. What was some of the key things? I, I know some of you history buffs out there because I was always fascinated. Not that I'm like an expert on it. No, I'm just an average person who, you know, I, I have no life. So I'm watching documentaries and things throughout the years. But there was a there was an interesting fact that they had done studies, the Nazis. If you say something, a lie, you, you create something. And you repeat it enough to the populace, it becomes the truth. They believe it. And boy, let me tell you, it worked as far as calling Trump a dictator, a Nazi, and all of this stuff. I, I saw a clip the other night. A guy was walking on the street, and he was asking people who they're voting for. And, and the guy says, Kamala. And he says, well, why? She, this woman... You can't make this stuff up. This woman says, I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, she's being serious. I'm afraid he's just going to get in office and stay there forever. <laughs> and my first thought when she said that, I was like, oh, my God. They bought into the left-wing propaganda machine. They bought into it. So now... They're doubling, and they're like, okay, well, let's see if that Nazi tactic worked. Now, again, they're 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 portraying Trump as a Nazi, but yet they're using Nazi tactics. Y'all go do this research yourself. Go go look it up. If you repeat a lie enough to the people, they will believe it. It becomes the truth to them. They believe it. I'm not making this up out of whole cloth. I, it's a fascinating phenomenon, but it's true. It works. It absolutely works. So here's a little bit of montage. I found this clip of 
of them repeating it. I'm not making this up. So um, let me get this in, in, the, in the picture here. Have some patience with me. I, I'm having to do all this mess myself. <laughs> but uh, let, let, check this out. Check this out. Joy! 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 But something they're a little light on are the specifics. The Kamala Harris website remains vague. There's bios for her and her running mate, Tim Walz, but there are noticeably no policy stances. Maybe the party faithful could help fill those details in. Do you have faith in Kamala Harris? Of course. What do you hope Kamala Harris gets done on day one? She's going to change something. Something. She's going to change something. There haven't been a lot of details. Yeah. So when it comes to specifics, you're excited. I'm sorry, but I find that hysterical. She's going to change something. And it's going to be profound. And it's going to be joyful. <laughs> now, if somebody asked me who I was voting for, I would say Trump. And, and of course, they're probably going to follow up with why. I'd say, well, he wants to close the border. He wants to lower taxes. He wants to give tax incentives to companies to keep them here in America. He wants to deport people. He wants to stop them trying to uh, stop fossil fuels so we can still drive our gas-powered cars. I, I, I just named five things. And of course, there's dozens of other things that I probably can't just remember off the top of my head, but those are the things that are important to me. Stop the border. Oh, oh, yeah, and he wants to drill. He wants to stop buying crap from other countries and drill, baby, drill here. Create jobs. Could lower the fuel energy prices. <laughs> I mean, most of them, guys, that I have... When I'm watching these people on the streets asking these people, well, why are you voting for Kamala? Which is a legitimate question. Okay, well, you're you're willing to ask because some people say it's none of your business. And, and it pretty much is, you know, some people don't want to tell what their political views are in fear of some kind of retaliation or whatever. You know, to each his own, and that's fine. But 99.9% .9 of them that I've seen, and y'all can go look them up. <laughs> When they're asked why they voting for Kamala, oh, she's going to do great on the border. <laughs> I seen one guy the other night say that. I was like, oh, my God. She's supposed to have been the, been the border czar. But, but, but again, the point I'm trying to make is most of them are, are don't even know what she wants to do. Now, she did say the other day. I watched something that she was saying, uh, given a $25,000 tax credit to buy a new home. Well, I'm not a real estate expert, but you got to have money to buy the house first. And I think that just comes off of taxing after you buy the home. And you have to have what? 10% down to, to buy a home in this economy. And, and then we're going to get more of the same of, of, um, of the the Kamala Harris and Biden economy right now, it just it just cracks me up. Let's see what let's see a little bit more of this. I, I haven't seen the rest of this. Then on day one, she's gonna get something done. Something done. Yeah. That's inspiring. Any specifics on the policies that you're excited about with Kamala Harris? Uh, well, I I think I'm excited about what uh, the prospects are. Prospects. And, I mean, because you know the, poten the potential, potential potential for policy. Some... It's exciting. <laughs> She, <laughs> she, oh my God, I don't, man, this is funny. She has the potential to do a great job. <laughs> and while she's doing it, it's going to be joyful. <laughs> oh, joy. Oh, the joy. 
This is hilarious. The, the yeah. prospects of potential policy is a very yeah. exciting thing. Is there positive policies there, coming? There, there, there's more coming. There's more coming. It's going to be a slow drip, you know? You're not going to be like Drake and just drop all the policies at once. It's going to be like Kendrick. It's like, ooh, that's a hot policy. Oh, that's another one. Another one, okay? Give it time. It's going to happen. Can you name a policy of hers you're excited about? going on people if anybody's watching this video <laughs> if you're voting for Kamala Harris please in the comments tell me why are you voting for her I know two things right now and I'm not even voting for her but I've been kind of paying attention okay she wants to give a $25,000 tax cut to first-time homebuyers. Again, that's after you purchase the house. You need 10% down. Two, now, this ain't even her policy. This is Biden's did this. And then they were stomping on it about a week ago. He was talking, stomping for her. She introduces him. And they're talking about that they lowered the uh, uh, prescription for insulin and some other crap. Whatever. Okay. But that's not hers. That was Biden's. And I think a lot of that's left over from Trump. <laughs> I mean, that's the only two things. One, she's running on Biden's policy. Two... She's coming up with some stupid twenty-five thousand tax break on first-time home buyers. Okay, that's that's the only two I know of, guys. Um, tell me if I'm you know missing something here because I need to know. I need to know. I really do. Oh my gosh, freezing right now. I would say at least get some rest so she get ready to take over. So Donald Trump wants to be dictator day one. Kamala Harris, you think big nap? Yes. Okay, so come on. <laughs> Again. <coughs> Excuse me. Trump wants to be a dictator. There's one of the talking points. And Kamala needs to take a nap with Joe Biden. Oh, man. That's. Oh, my God. Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. That's hysterical. She said Kamala needs a rest. Kamala needs a break. She needs something. <laughs> oh, man. Am I going to make it through this? I don't know. I haven't seen this. This is hilarious. Well, has got some work to do. But Trump has articulated his vision very clearly. I'm a better looking person <laughs> than Kamala. Donald Trump recently said that he was prettier than Kamala Harris. I mean, should the presidency be a beauty contest? No, it should be a, a it should be a contest of intelligence. I'm sorry, Kamala Harris hasn't beat. But if it look, he said that to be funny, and it was funny. Come on, it's, it, you can't even be funny in this country anymore without somebody's feelings getting hurt or boo freaking who. I mean, come on, that was just the. A joke! Being funny! <laughs> it's ridiculous. We're a beauty contest. Kamala Harris has not beat. It's just superficial. I mean, it's, it's all about what's in your brain, what's in your heart. But if it were a beauty contest, I mean, what would you judge this? He looks like a melted caramel. Good. But we're about that. Yeah. I don't think Donald Trump is prettier than anybody or anything. So. Right. We shouldn't talk about looks. It's about joy! Should that kind of discourse be? It's about joy. <laughs> this is stupid. <laughs> oh my god. Part of politics, commenting no. on each other's looks. No. Democrats are above that. Yes. He's about the ugliest man I've ever seen. I was though excited to come here to the DNC and to get yeah. away from Trump from a little bit, and I run into a Trump. You don't have to suppress any feelings when you're around me. Okay. Because I am channeling this joy. 
Your uncle recently said that he was prettier than Kamala Harris. Is that what he does? Does he do that at like Thanksgiving? He has to be prettier than everybody there? Oh, for everybody. Is that right? He's prettier, he's smarter, he's better, he's faster, he's stronger, he's richer, obviously, because that matters more. Is that a thing that just happens even when the cameras are off? No, no, he's exactly the same person in all settings. It's deeply disturbing. He would also walk into a middle school play and be like, ah. What, wouldn't you want somebody? Um, I think the rest of this is just just silliness. Um, I'm going to put this these links in the description so y'all could go watch the whole thing without any commentary or whatever. Because there were some at the beginning I, did, I didn't play. Um, would you want somebody who's the same all the time and doesn't switch on a whim for their audience? Remember, remember Hillary Clinton would, oh, I, she'd start having this southern accent when she was talking in the South. It was disgusting and despicable. Like, and everybody saw it. It was like, what are you doing? You, you to be genuine, you should be yourself, right? I mean, that that's what that's what I, I think. Now, so you heard the montage of "Oh joy, oh joy" from all of them at the DNC, and there was more, but he he only had a couple of clips. So I went and I I googled the Nazi joy thingy, right? The strength through joy was a Nazi program that they started. Okay, so I googled this. I googled this. So we have this one. This is a picture of some of the 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 uh, activities that they would do. Look at that. Look at that. She's got the uh, Nazi sign on her little, little dress there. Now, if you weren't Jewish... Romania, if you weren't any of that, then you you could go. You can go do or a Jehovah Witness <laughs> or any other persecuted minority, right? Now here's one. Here's one with a picture of a guy with a bullhorn, right? So I'm gonna just read a little bit. As again, I'm gonna put the descriptions in these links, and y'all can go read them yourself. Basically. Uh, in the early 1930s, uh, the regime implemented this, this strength through joy program. So it was through um, athlete, athletes and, and this kind of stuff, uh, the, the culture programs that, that would improve the health and productivity of the German workforce while easing the class tensions. Now, during the time, Germany was in like a depression because of World War I, and then they had to pay back all this money to England and God knows what other countries. Like I said, I'm not an expert, but I know they had to pay a bunch of money because of the war that they started and they lost. And, of course, Hitler's bitter about this. A lot of them are bitter about this. And they're still, they're still struggling. So, okay, damned everybody else. Hitler's going to start this program, the Nazis. <coughs> Strength through joy. So, y'all can go and read this. Um, it just goes on to say the programs that they were doing, and then they started persecuting the Jews, and the Jews couldn't be part of it. Oh, no, the Jews can't, be, can't participate in the joyful, <laughs> being joyful. No. They did this. So the point I'm trying to make here is uh, bringing this up is the playbook. They are, they're blaming Trump. Now, I'm not saying I'm not going to sit here and say Trump's a perfect man because there's no perfect man other than Jesus Christ was the most perfect man. And plus, he was God. Right. So nobody's perfect. I'm not saying that. But he's not a dictator. He's not doesn't have Nazi viewpoints. He doesn't spout socialism. But the left-wing Democrats do. It's obvious. Stop it. <laughs> and, and the talking points, come on, I just brought up. Y'all can go and research them calling him the Hitler and all of this crap, saying he's a dictator, which is a lie. But I guess what? It stuck. That stuck with, that resonated with people. And I think it's people that don't have, can't think for themselves or 
I, I don't know why they would believe it. If somebody says something kind of outrageous, wouldn't you as logically think, well, hmm, I'm questioning that. I'm going to go see what's going on. Where's the source? What is, why are they saying this about this certain person that's so horrendous? Because to equate somebody to Hitler is, is pretty horrendous. It's pretty horrendous. He murdered millions of people. Millions of people. And to say that lightly and have those talking points on all these shows is despicable and disgusting. And then they had a picture of him. Y'all can go. I didn't pull it up. I don't want to, But y'all can go look at it. Where they had Trump's face one way and Hitler's face another way. And, you know, had back, their heads were back to back. It was just disgusting. It's like, why are you doing this? It's called propaganda. And it's straight out of the Nazi playbook. This is what we're talking about. This is why I'm, I'm bringing this up. Now, I'm going to save these. I'm going to put these links um, in the description. Y'all can go read them and, and look for yourself because, you know, you should never take anybody's word for anything. Go and look it up. Think, Please think for yourself. Now, we're going to take a look at this video here. This is um, Christian Watson. Let me make sure I get his, uh, I'm going to get his name in here. Don't give me a moment. I, you know, it takes me a moment to do things around here. Y'all know this. All right. So he's going to talk about it. This guy, uh, he's another one of the, the black uh, Christian conservatives. This guy is so smart. <laughs> He is just phenomenal. I found him just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> I think about two weeks ago I discovered this guy. I'm scrolling through looking for articles or whatever it is I'm doing. And I found this guy and I started watching him. I was like, whoa, he is smart. <laughs> like, like super smart. Like he's, he can describe these things more, way more articulate with an intellectual viewpoint than, than I can. I'm just talking like the regular person on the street, right? I, I feel like I am. You know, I'm just a regular Joe Schmo, you know. But his name is Christian Watson, and um, he's going to talk about the meaning behind Kamala's campaign of joy. Now, I haven't watched this, so I don't really know what all he's going to say. I wanted to get a fresh reaction, and I don't even know if if I'll be able to even add commentary to this intellectual guy here but i will have to stop it and, and say something because you know i don't want to get copyrighted plus this guy deserves views and his monetization and all of this good stuff right so that that's the thing if you guys aren't familiar with um other uh youtube creators you use you, there is a fair use where you can use other people's stuff and you could like I'm reacting to him, right? But I just can't sit quiet the whole time and let his whole thing play, you know, and expect to to gain from it, right? So it it it, it does make it fair. So, but I'm just saying you can get I can get a copyright strike if I just let his stuff play, right? So just if y'all aren't familiar with any of that, I don't know. I'm just throwing this out there that this is what I have to do. But I guess the reason why I'm telling y'all that is because this guy is just super smart. It's just super smart. Anyway, y'all need to check him out. I mean, once we start. But anyway, this is uh, Christian Watson talking about uh, the meaning behind, oh, joy. And, you know, he's not funny. I'm saying he's a serious guy. He's serious. That last video cracked me up, y'all. Oh, my God. I... <laughs> You know, some mornings now it's 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 what it's well it's it's almost getting afternoon, but I needed a good laugh, and that really was a good laugh. <laughs> I hope y'all enjoyed that last segment we just did. All right, here we go. Let's see what he's got to say. So I'll go. I did a video talking about one of Kamala Harris's famed phrases. I should probably say infamous phrases. What can be unburdened by what has been. The video did quite well, but what was important about that video was how it dug deep into something that seems like an innocuous and mundane saying which now do y'all remember that what burden unburden what has been she repeated that there i did a video kamala chameleon it's a funny and i used the uh kama chameleon uh 
from Boy George's music and did a montage. And during the chorus part, I repeated that slogan that Kamala Harris would say from different speeches. Like, she didn't just say it one time or just two times. She repeated it everywhere she went. <laughs> Unburden what has been what. I mean, it's hysterical. Uh, y'all need to check that out. I, I thought it was funny actually conveys a fully thought out by somebody worldview that is quite dangerous for the survival of our republic. And I'm seeing the same theme emerge in this conversation around joy, which has become a motto of the Harris campaign and has been invoked by several of her high ranking, high profile surrogates throughout the DNC and throughout the campaign season. Joy! 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 The joy felt by Americans backing the Harris Walls ticket. We are joyful warriors. Being joyful is part of the American identity. The joy factor. <laughs> Campaign of joy. You're talking about radical joy. It is downright joyful. It looks like a joyous rally. It looks like a joyous occasion. A real zeal and joy. Well, the truth is this discussion about joy as some on the right are... Why? Why? Every one of them. Every one of them. I told you, they got a committee. They got they got a think tank just on propaganda, a propaganda think tank. Now, I guess there's nothing wrong with having a think tank like, well, you know, how can we manage our campaign? You know, what what are the 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 people's concerns in America. Oh, no. The DNC. No, they can't do that. It's not the concerns of what America wants. It's like, how can we spew propaganda to make them um, ignore the pain at the pump or the pain at the grocery store? <laughs> Let's tell them they have joy in this party. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> It's so funny, but serious at the same time. These people are serious. And look at that montage. This happens with all this. Everything's weird. Everything's weird. Look up weird. They are all talking points saying it. He's a, he's, a, he's a dictator. He's Hitler. All of them said it. Now this, joy. All of them say it. It is, it is absurd. They don't care. Apparently they don't care. That somebody's gonna montage them. They're like, it's okay, just ignore it because the the, the people the people we're we're you know trying to target are just minds full of mush and the sheep will come. <laughs> and damn, they're right. Because oh no, if Trump gets elected, he's just gonna be a dictator and he's never gonna leave office. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if he was such a dictator first time around, he wouldn't have left. What the you people out of your mind? What is going on here? They're calling it is not merely an emotional platitude. It's not merely an appeal to emptiness. It is actually a example of the view of human nature that progressives have. And it's also an example of how progressives and the left more generally view political values and how they should be transmitted to the republic. And its consequences are not just political. Its consequences are actually detrimental to the advancement of civilization and human thinking. And in this video, we're going to explore the sinister meaning of joy as it is deployed in the context of the Harris campaign. And we're going to discuss the right way to think about politics that is divorced from such phrases and concepts. But before we get into that, my friends, hope all of you are doing well. I am Christian Watson. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoy political and social commentary from a philosophical bent, then I implore you, please like, share, comment, subscribe, do whatever you can to get this video out there. We are here to build an army of thinkers to have a reasoned political discourse based around sound thinking, not based around talking points. Or Yeah, he's very theological. Like I said, this guy is super, super duper smart. I'm, I'm thankful I found him because he has some interesting, interesting stuff. Um, Y'all need to check him out. He's really good. I mean, I like to joke around and have some fun. 
Plus, some of the stuff just cracks me up. Just naturally, it's just funny. But he's serious, and and, and he's he's dead on. And when he's, you know. For owning the lib, so to speak. So thank you guys so much for being here. Now, please enjoy the video. So yes, joy is the motto of the Kamala Harris campaign. And the response to the emergence of this motto has normally been just to dismiss it as yet another political slogan, an empty political slogan that is being deployed by an increasingly vain and vacuous candidacy to the presidency, which would be Kamala Harris's candidacy. But this view is decidedly a mistake. See, oftentimes things that we dismiss carry greater significance than what we actually think. So in order to understand why Kamala Harris and the progressives are using joy as a political argument, in order to understand why big publications are publishing op-eds and articles basically saying that joy is a wonderful argument for the Kamala Harris campaign, and also that joy is a wonderful argument for constituencies who's a bad- Did y'all see that, that that one said to fight fascism? When I saw- Oprah Winfrey and a couple other ones. And then I was watching some news reports in the last few days. And they were all saying joy is when I was like, well, this is. It It didn't suck me in. I thought this. This is weird. <laughs> Let, let's use their. Let's use their talking points. But it was. I was like, this is kind of strange. Where, where's the joy? This is a joyful event. Oprah Winfrey saying how, oh, the joy. Right? Is anybody feeling any joy getting gas, going to the grocery store? Power bill through the roof? I mean, I, I'm just like, well, this is, well, I didn't fall for it. To, to be joyful? Value should be decidedly against. Kamala Harris, like, for example, the article that came out that said that Catholic women should support Kamala Harris because she is an embodiment of joy, despite the fact that Kamala Harris supports abortion, which is decidedly anti-Catholic, different story, different day, we have... Where's the joy in reporting children? I think they're, they're, somebody had said, now I didn't coin this phrase, but somebody said they're the party of death. Hell, they had Planned Parenthood outside their DNC. Abort, uh, giving them abortion pills, and uh, vasectomies to to men. Who the hell? Yeah, they're the party of death. Where's the joy in that? I did any did any does anybody think there's joy in any of that? I have to understand what joy means and what its relationship to human nature and human understanding is. And the moment we understand that is the moment we can understand the kind of joy Kamala Harris is deploying is a sinister kind of joy whose view of human nature has profound and disturbing political implications. So let us first start with a discussion of what joy is. What is joy, my friends? Well, joy is two things. Number one, it's a state of being. And number two, it is an emotion. Now, what is the difference between an emotion and a state of being? A state of being is the whole of how you are at a particular time. An emotion is a thing that you may feel for five seconds, 10 seconds, two hours, three hours, but it is not the entirety of your state of being, where the state of being essentially dominates how you feel for a prolonged period of time. So someone that has clinical depression has a state of being that is at least in some cases informed by depression, whereas someone who is just depressed in a moment is feeling a sense of palpable sadness that may recede or may go away with the passage of time. time. But in both cases, a joy as a state of being and joy as an emotion, both cases, it is produced by a section, a category of human nature that brings forth the passions. Now, there are multiple categories of human nature that we have to understand to understand human nature. But for our purposes... I told you this guy is incredibly articulate and man. I have to stop this. And, and what do I got to say? <laughs> I cannot be as well versed in speaking as this gentleman. 
But he's describing that it's part of your well-being. I, I, I haven't seen this yet. I mean, yeah, I'm subscribed to his channel, but I haven't seen this video, but I thought it would go for So I don't know if he's going to get into the the Nazi propaganda part of it or not. I, I don't know. But it'd be interesting if he does. But um, I just I just found that. I was like, well, this is interesting. Oh, joy. And I started looking it up, and I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Just here, we're going to stick with two categories. The first category is the lizard brain category. It is the category of intuition, of gut feelings, of tastes, plain sentiments, emotions. And these concepts are all constituent parts of this section of human nature. And then there's the other category. The other category is the category of intellection, of cognition, of reason, of abstraction, being able to understand abstract principles and apply them to the real world. I hope all of you are getting this. That's the other category. Now, to this category belongs civilization, the latter category. So the former category belongs things that are anti-civilizational, that are anti-social, like let's say violence, let's say primality, let's say you know, rage, things like that. But all of these things, if you view human nature as a, as a spectrum, come together in a composite to make up human nature. Now, you will immediately understand, the astute viewer will immediately understand that Kamala Harris is leveraging this compartment of human nature that deals with the lizard brain, the compartment of human nature that deals with intuition. I, I'll call it the sentimental part of human nature. And the practical effect of leveraging this aspect of human nature to make a political argument is a regression in human understanding of concepts. This is... I think... The liberal Democrats have been masters at it. I think they, they, I always refer to these think tanks, that they, they look at, look at the human psyche. Let's dump down education. We can implement this. We can say this. We can say that. And, and, and people buy into it because it sounds, they make it sound good. They make all of it sound good. They play upon the emotion. I understand what he's saying. I just can't say it like he does. This guy is just off the charts. He's smart. I, I Y'all like uh, Jordan Peterson? I love watching Jordan Peterson. I'd love to do some videos of him, but, but what am I going to say? Why he's talking? I mean, he's just so... He's just so incredibly smart. This is where this Kamala Harris joy, joy, joy mm -hmm. gets so sinister. So the progressives... Generally, throughout their entire uh, intellectual tradition, going all the way back to Woodrow Wilson, going all the way back to John Dewey, going all the way back to these Herbert Crowley, Walter Lippmann, these actors in the history of political ideas, the progressives have always leveraged sentiment as a means of justifying their political order. What did Woodrow Wilson say in 1913 in his speech, The New Freedom? He said that we are bound in society by the laws of Darwin, not the laws of Newton. And that society, he goes on to say in the next paragraph, society is this organic thing that grows and grows and grows and grows. And therefore, the interests of society change, the demands, the passions change, and therefore, so must our laws. Therefore, we can't have a fixed constitution. Well, part of this sort of what I call it the organic theory of society, you with me? The part of the organic theory of society is the idea that our passions can move society and our passions should then therefore inform politics. So it's a kind of... It's true because that's what happened during the Obama administration. Passion. Wasn't substance because he was a socialist. Uh, his whole stumping a socialist. It hit, that passion didn't sway me personally. But I, I understand what he's saying. That it, it, we've seen this in the past that this, the passion playing upon that emotion and getting people joyful about it is, is it's, it's kind of disturbing in a way when you think about it. Oh. To this kind nature to make a political argument is a regression in human understanding of concepts. This is where this Kamala Harris joy, joy, joy gets so sinister. So the progressives generally throughout their entire 
uh, intellectual tradition, going all the way back to Woodrow Wilson, going all the way back to John Dewey, going all the way back to the greater goal, even if passion may ultimately be detrimental to the right goal. So we should understand the backdrop here. So progressives, they historically mix um, political values with emotions. Uh, and, and in doing this, uh, they, can, they can only understand truly political engagement through that lens, or they can only leverage it through that lens ultimately. So if you leverage political values with emotions, what you're unable to do is actually apply your reason to the world in a manner that A, makes things sensible, and B, allows you to to, to impose certain concepts and certain understandings in the correct and functional way. If you have a standard of reason being the forerunner of political values, through that standard, you are able to understand, okay, I have this value, I have the ability to think, I have this first principles basis, and I also have experience, I also have empiricism, I also have these things that are detached from my own personal belief system. But the moment you leverage this sentimental part of the human being, you are confining man's understanding to his preconceptions. You are confining man's understanding to his belief system, regardless of if his belief system or his preconceptions are logically sound, rational, or even make sense against experience. It does not matter because the entire constellation of the consideration of knowledge, the entire epistemology of man's political understanding under that category is his sentiment. And his sentiment can change with, again, the flow of time, and it can also come from so many forces. Now, a rational first principles-based understanding of politics has guardrails that are present through, as I mentioned, defining principles, which can be then debated and critiqued in the public square. But the latter, it's it's dangerous what they do, but I think they all they've all been doing it. I don't know. I don't know if the Republicans are doing it. I wouldn't doubt if all parties were doing this where we're we're at a it's like a, a warfare of the mind. It's either in advertisement, how how they advertise to us when you go in a grocery store. Uh, I mean, they did studies on this where you walk in, where do you see the most expensive cereal that, that's going to be attracted to your kids are right there at eye level. I mean, this is, this goes deep. This goes deep. Even as, like I said, even, even, uh, advertising to us on things to buy things to wear. I mean, who, there's a think tank on what's the next crave going to be as far as the next style. Who the hell came up with skinny jeans? <laughs> For guys. It's like, what? <laughs> I don't know. I think they're goofy, but that's just me personally. But I'm thinking somebody's like, yeah, let's come up with these ideas. So guess what? It it does impact our psyche on, on in clothing. She's just thinking something so basic. It's something so detrimental in our thinking to to go and like, oh, you see this, you see models wearing this, and now you're going to wear it because, you know, they, they got you. So now I think what he's he's getting at, if my little my little brain full of mush is is the psyche part of of them reaching in and getting you emotionally engaged instead of the policies. Let's ignore the policies. Because has she said anything? Like that woman before? Hey, well, why are you voting for her? She doesn't know. She doesn't know, but she's joyful. She's excited. They're in there. Their heart's pumping. They're seeing Kamala Harris. They're all excited in the moment. It's it's just kind of it's kind of creepy. <laughs> it's kind of like you know when you were a kid and you're going to a rock concert and you're going with all your friends. That excitement, right? You're excited. You're going. You're going to hang out with your buddies. Y'all are going to have a good time. You're going to see all the hear all the songs that you like, whatever band it was. Um. It's kind of okay. You remember that feeling? That that was when you I was a kid. These people are adults, and they're they're having this emotion tied with political. 
I don't know. That's that's kind of weird. I, I would be very careful. I think as far as spiritually, on who are you going to glorify or who is getting to make your body or your your body feel that way? Like some, you know, I'm gonna get. I'm not excited about Trump. <laughs> I don't have this joy. I just hear what the man's going to do. It's his job. He has a job. He's got to go to work. He puts his pants on just like everybody else. That's his job. We need somebody to do the job. So we have to elect somebody to do the job. It shouldn't be a popularity contest. It should be based on ideas. What are they going to do for us? What are they going to do for the country? That's what it should be based on, not emotion and this, you know... I don't understand. I don't understand it, but it's it's psychological. It's spiritual. It's probably all of that above, right? That you would invest that much emotion into another human being, and, and that's not like okay, your wife or your husband. You love them. You love your children. That's a that's a whole different kind of emotion and, and a whole different joy that your family brings you. This is having this to to some political figure, or for that matter, a rock star or a movie star. Yeah, I was misguided as a teenager and getting excited about going to concert. I was a kid. Now I understand. I'm not going to stand there and kind of worship these people. They're just people, just like me. They're just people doing a job. Do we enjoy the job they do, some of the musicians? Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not going to be doing all this crap, my hands up in the air, like I'm worshiping them. I, I've, even when, you know, even when I was a teenager, I found it strange that everybody in the crowd was doing that. I'd look, I'd always get the nosebleed seats or have to sit down because I couldn't stand long. I don't know. I didn't like it. But anyway, and I'd be looking around and in my mind, I never talked about it to anybody because I think they might, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> I would I would think uh why are they doing that? They're all shooting the devil sign. They all got their hands up in the air and and I remember my mother used to watch all these Christian programs and these churches and stuff. And that's what the church people would be doing to the pastor and they're worshiping God. And then I mean my mother watched this stuff all the time, you know, when we got cable when I was a kid. So when then I'm going to these concerts and I'm looking and I'm like this looks familiar to me and my brain. I don't know if any of y'all had that connection like I did. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. But the thing is, I had I made that connection like, wow, this looks like worship. And I didn't want to be part of that. I'm not going to worship a person because I always was taught that you can't have any other. You can't have idols. You, you, you can't be doing that. It's wrong. So, yeah. So I think these people are having this worship mentality and this joyful emotion that's misplaced. The category of sentiment, being a subjective experience, is exempt from debate and examination and is therefore susceptible to the winds of propaganda, to the passions of the person, and also it's, it can create a flawed understanding of the person themselves who feels this joy. You understand, this is why it is so dangerous to understand politics in terms of sensations. This is why it's so dangerous to understand politics, as Pete Buttigieg said to the DNC, as a kind of soul craft. Because there are just so many different passions that are not controllable that just arise spontaneously and ultimately impair your ability to understand things well. This is the sinister effect of joy. It, it regresses human thoughtfulness from reason to emotivism, which is the act of making ethical judgments based on how you feel, and it encourages people to view their lower instincts, the sentiment part of you, uh, as values rather than holding values higher than your lower instincts. Now, let's kind of extrapolate this out to a civilizational level so you guys can understand what I'm saying. We have to look at this in the context of pre-civilized man and civilized man. So. Primitive man. What distinguishes primitive man, our caveman ancestors, those who didn't really have the means of communication that we have now or the understanding of the world? What distinguishes primitive man from civilized man? 
Well, very simply, what the only thing that distinguishes primitive man from civilized man is the stage of intellection. Remember that word I mentioned? The state of intellection that both have found themselves in. Primitive man was held back by how he perceived the world. Intuition, gut feelings, joy in this context dominated his entire belief system. Primitive tribes gathered around fire, for example. When was primitive man? <laughs> Just asking questions here, people. I mean, if Adam and Eve were the first man and woman, where the hell is the primitive man? Was that pre-Adam and Eve? <laughs> I don't know. Just asking questions. It's it's. A, I always love to think about stuff like that. I mean, I know, you know, we had to learn evolution in school and this crap. But the Bible's telling us Adam and Eve, first man, first woman. They have two. They have two sons. One of them kills the other one. And that bunch of kids, and then you get the tribes. Then here comes along Noah. And, uh, you know, we know what happens after that. But I'm just saying. <laughs> where, where was primitive man? Was that pre-Adam and Eve? Obviously, it had to have been. And avoided the darkness of the forest. Because it was understood back in those days that if you go away from the fire and into the darkness of the forest, you may not come back. You may die. The fire represented the totality of their world. The safe world and only until the fire became expanded out from the village and was pushed forth into the wilderness to light it up and to bring in knowledge because light is the prerequisite for knowledge for understanding for seeing was civilization actually born so whereas primitive man clung to fire like a god like an ancient stone god civilized man used fire to create homes, machines, torches, maps, and other tools that he used to challenge the limitations of space and time and to expand his understanding of the world. Civilized man truly only accomplished this by thinking beyond intuition and applying the creative element of his mind to bend nature to his whims. Where primitive man feared the darkness, civilized man conquered it, slayed it, cut it up, cut it up and won a victory over it in a complete and utter curb stop. But let's say we can revert civilized man back to intuition and back to emotivism and those two perspectives alone. He would lose his ability to apply his creativity to the world and understand it truthfully. Christian, what does that have to do with Kamala Harris? Very simply, everything. If joy, which is part of that lower compartment that I mentioned, is the prime mover of one's political considerations, they are effectively resigning themselves in part to the primitive condition of their nature. They are going from civilized thinking to primitive thinking. It's genius. I'm telling you, man. It, they are masterful at it. We are duped all the time. And we, we're, I, I'm probably, I'm duped and don't even know I'm being duped. Either buy products I buy, or they tell me something's on sale, and you're like, oh, I'm getting a good deal, but it probably didn't cost them $2 to make the damn thing. And we're all getting duped. Why would not they do it on a psychological level? It's profound. It really is. It's, it's psychological warfare, and spiritual as well. That's my opinion, anyway. That is why joy in the Harris sense, regresses human thinking, and along with it, civilization. A civilization can only truly birth a strong political order if it is informed by principles and understood through reason and debate, stamped with the assurance of experience, not with the sensations of the mind. Well, see, that's what I was kind of saying earlier, I guess, not as eloquent as him, is that... For me personally, I'm not emotionally attacked. Well, I do get angry about the policies, the abortion policies, them able to kill a baby after it's been born. That that bothers my soul. That 
that's on a spiritual deeper level. Like this is insanity or butchering our children. So yeah, I do have some kind of emotional attachment as far as that goes, but that's based on the policy. That's not based on Trump and his team and that I'm all like glorifying him, you know, like he's some God and put him on a pedestal. Like like the, like the Kamala Harris people are. It's all joyful and no substance. There's no meat. And it, it's, it's kind of frightening, guys. I, I think it is. That they could, they, they're masterful manipulators. I think um, some people become, can become delusional. I don't know. The Bible says that in the end times, people become delusional and believe the lie. But I, I don't, I'm not saying that we're, we're there yet, but good night. We're getting close because uh, we're just becoming another Sodom and Gomorrah. But the thing is, is that they're, they're manipulating us. They're manipulating our children in school. It's all plot and planned, and it's, it's incredible. It's incredible what they're doing. And what they've been doing. That is the danger of joy, my friends. Joy, any emotion, whether it be joy, whether it be happiness, whether it be sadness, whether it be rage, necessarily clouds the mind. These are not these are important parts of human nature for sure. And in fact, I would even argue that emotions, unlike what some of my brethren on the right said, they are not empty, they're not vacuous. No, emotions actually play a big part in informing the character of our reason. If they don't for you, then I would submit to you, you have something wrong with you, or you're a sociopath. You're a sociopath. You I agree with that because I was just making the comment a moment ago that what uh, emotionally I'm, I'm upset, and I hope a lot of parents out there are upset. It seems like we are pushing back on this woke crap. Now that to me, it's a logical uh, transformation of feeling or emotion to to something so horrendous, right? I, if that doesn't move you, yeah, like he said, there's something wrong with you. But so many people just think it's okay. They bought into the lie that, that this abortion thing is okay for America. And it's not. It's killing us. We're having an aging population. There's a problem. We're not we're not going to have enough young people to take care of us. We're not having children and we're aborting the ones we are. It's insane. And this is happening all over the world. Cuz emotions played into it. They they created this emotional thing at at a ripe time back back in the 60s. <laughs> Free love and all this stuff and fight the fight the power, you know, stick it to the man. And and women have or to, to be empowered, you got the right to do what you want with your body. There's no consequences for sex. This was all emotionally driven. It wasn't I don't think it was based on logic or morality. Because if it was based on morality, we wouldn't be having this conversation. They'd be like, no, that's that's wrong. Oh, but we don't have God anymore. We don't need God. Man has become successful. Man has conquered. Man has technology. Oh, we have technology. Like, I, I know you people. You guys, as old as me. <laughs> we grew up, no cell phone. None of this stuff. None of this stuff. What, the past, what, 20 years since like 2001, 2002, where, where you started seeing more and more common folk being able to uh, have a cell phone, make it, make it affordable. Now, I remember prior to that, they had these cell phones that were ginormous. Y'all remember that? The, the ginormous cell phones that it costed a fortune to use it. <laughs> You'd have to be pretty wealthy to have them. But they had them. But now, for I'm saying for the masses... The past 20 years, there has been an explosion in technology. Why do we need God? Why, why, has, why had we need God? We, we started not needing God back in the 60s. We have technology. We have air conditioner. We have indoor plumbing. We don't need God. But uh, we have emotion. 
We have joy. We have these other things that we can use to control people, to get them to sway towards us. We have language. So they're using they're using a combination of both of language, of the way they phrase things, and emotion combined. It's genius. Pro abortion. Pro abortion. You have a right to your own body. You have say over your body. That gives somebody a feeling of empowerment. If if you if you put it in that perspective, at least to me, it, it seems that way. You have put this empowerment in them, and and it sparked something, like oh, I have control. I have empowerment. I have the right to do what I want. I can do what I want. And that's I think that's where it stemmed from. A lot of it. And the, they have masterfully, masterfully done this. And then now here we have this. We have old joy. And it's working, people. It's working. Is their reason without leveraging emotion. And for that reason, they're able to kill people and do other unspeakable things to people with no remorse. So no, there are emotions that are important to our being human, that constitute being human, but they're a part of the lower part of ourselves and they must be contextualized within the broader context. When these things are divorced in the broader context and they overtake man's mind and they direct his political considerations, what, what's the result? The result is a decision made on the basis of passion that may not correct for the laws of authoritarianism that may not correct for the errors of the person you're voting for or supporting, and they also fundamentally do not have in mind the preservation of society, as all political decisions should have in mind. They have instead the continuance of that emotional feeling that the person has, a binding to sensation. The Nazis did it. the people of Germany stand by why their neighbors, their friends that they've probably known most of their life, have their businesses shut down, kicked out of their homes, and they sat by and didn't say shit. How? Because it was the propaganda of emotion of telling them that they're go they want an inferior race, the Aryan race, the purity of Germans, everybody else, no. We need to get rid of them. We need to get them away from us. How did they do this? How did they implement this on the German people? The German people didn't stand up and tell the Nazi party and Hitler, what are you doing? No, we don't want this. These are our neighbors, our friends. We've known for generations. They stood by and did nothing. Because they bought into the emotion of being an Aryan nation. The strength and joy program. But if you were Jewish, you weren't part of that strength of joy program. No, you were not. If you were anything else, no. We're sticking you on a train. We're taking you to concentration camps. And the German people stood by and did nothing. They allowed this to happen. They saw it happening. They could not have been blind to this. As millions of Jews were packed up, kicked out of their homes, kicked out of their businesses. All, and they were putting bans on all of them before they started kicking them out. They, they were like, you need to be identified as a Jew. And the German people were seeing this. And it, what was it based on? Emotion. How could they implement this without it? it it's insanity, right? You're thinking, well, if, if you lived there, what would you do? Would you stand up for your neighbor, your Jewish neighbor? Would have you? Or you would have just kept quiet because you don't want to get kicked out of your home. Or you just went with it. I mean, as soon as he started tagging people, 
They all could have stood up and go, what are you doing? We're against this. Stop it. No, we could still have the strength and joy or the strength and unity or whatever it is they're peddling with everyone who's a citizen of Germany. But no, you are not bred right. You are the problem. You are not Arion. You are not blonde hair, blue eyed. We don't want you. And the German people bought into this. How? It's through emotion. Through emotion and through language, language propaganda, how they worded things, how they presented it to them. Because you're thinking, my God, how did this, how did this happen? And that's, that's how it happened. It's dangerous. And if a person uses voting like a drug, voting like to get a political high, then they're not going to care about anything else other than getting that political high. Kamala Harris's campaign is hijacking the sensations, the dopamine receptors of people, and then directing them into a perpetual state of political highness. And that is her plan to win. And that is her plan to win. This is a civilizational problem, my friends. This is a problem that goes way beyond what your influencers will talk about. This is a problem that cuts straight to the core of what it actually means to be a human being. All political questions are at first human questions. All political questions are at first ethical questions. And all ethical questions are questions of conduct. And all questions of conduct must be rooted to the sound ground of evaluating unchanging human nature. And if you do that, it's very obvious to see why Kamala Harris's joy is actually not joy. It is a hellish regression in our skills as human beings, glossed up with lipstick and glitter, that any thinking person, regardless of who you are, should ultimately reject. Have joy, yes, but don't let joy dominate your consideration when it comes to whoever you decide to support for this election. Let joy be a constituent of your reason. Let joy be a constituent of your merits and your accomplishment. Not, not let your entire humanity be a constituent of your joy. And most certainly don't make your decisions be a constituent of your joy because ultimately that has the recipe of producing situations that are not joyful objectively for any of us. My friends, like, share, comment, subscribe to wherever you can to get this message out there. My friends, study history, study philosophy, or any more looking at them, please stay pensive. Bye, guys. Yeah, I need to study philosophy. <laughs> Let's see here. Let's get this uh, window. Yeah, it takes me a moment to do stuff, people. Um, wow. This is, uh, this is crazy. Let's see. Let's go. Boom, boom. Okay. I hope y'all enjoyed that. This guy is really smart and a lot of philosophy and theorists in, in, in that. But I like stuff like that. I, like, I could watch Jordan Peterson all day. Uh, I don't know if everybody else can, but I enjoy his his programming. Uh, his series on the Exodus is, is awesome. It's excellent. You need to check it out. I mean, you can watch it in parts. It, uh, YouTube saves your spot, you know. Just go back to your history and pull it up because each one of them are a little long. They've got a round table and they're all, they read um, a part of scripture and then they all discuss it. It's it's really, it's really interesting. <clears throat> but I think we all need to um, be vigilant, understand our bodies why am I feeling this way? Why am I getting emotionally moved by certain things and question it? We, you question it. Like, why, why am I angry about this situation? Well, is it morally wrong? Why am I excited about something? Why does this person uh, give me the, this, this feeling of, of excitement and joy or whatever? I... Especially if it's a political person. They're just people. They have a job to do. And we have our job to do. 
We are to look at the facts. Look at what they're standing for. Does it does it does it meet your moral standards and your beliefs and what direction you want your city to city in, your school council in, your your the police department? This is all like city level governing, which we probably should be voting. I'm guilty. I don't always vote on that mess. I'm guilty of that. But we all need to do a better job. But voting and, and just voting for anything on any platform, it has to, my opinion, it should be based on does it does it flow with your with your Christian beliefs? If if you're a liberal, does it flow with your liberal beliefs? Which I don't even know what the hell they don't believe in nothing. <laughs> they they want freedom. But y'all heard them a while back. I mean, I talked about this in the last video. They were like, oh, we're a party of freedom. So now we've got freedom. We've got joy. So freedom and joy to, for a man to go in a woman's bathroom. Look, just try to be aware of how it's affecting you. Think about it. Don't get controlled by it. Think about it. Think for yourself. Hey, don't listen to me. Listen to you. Listen to your heart. Pray about it. Lord, especially if you're a Christian, obviously pray. Why is this moving me? What should I do? Does this align with, with my values, with Christianity values, with the Ten Commandments, with any all of this? How are they going to benefit the country? What are they doing? What have they done? What has Biden and Kamala done? They have wrecked the country. What did Obama do? He wrecked the health care system. Guys, any y'all know you don't need a motion to know this. Everything government touches turns to crap. They didn't even care about the border. We had somebody who did, Trump, first time president I've ever seen in my lifetime, start building a wall. I'm like, oh my God, look at this. This is awesome. He's actually doing his job. He's doing his job. Did he get everything accomplished that he wants? None of them ever do when they say, hey, I'm going to get this. I want to get this done. Because they got to jump through hoops to get crap done. But he got, he's got, he was working on that. He was getting that done. He was getting it done. Well, guys, I hope y'all enjoyed that video. Um, I did. I really like him. Um, give him a like and go check his, out his other channels. Like I said, he's he's so smart. Um, he's got that other one on Kamala Harris, and it's serious too. Now, I we all laugh when we see those montages of them saying that, but because uh, it is funny. Uh, but it's a serious thing. How he describes what what it means. I mean, he's going on and saying like they they're not going backwards. They're going forwards to what are they going forward to? They're wanting to transform America. That's what she's talking about. They're going forward. They're going to keep going, keep destroying. What is the Saul Alinsky book for radical rules for radicals? What was one of the key points in that book was before you could have a government in place, you have to destroy it from within. Destroy the country from within, and then you have something ready to replace it with. What do you, that's what they're doing. That is what they're doing, people. If y'all can't see it, I, I don't know what to tell you. Y your eyes need to wake up and see how drastically we have we have progressed in a progression of liberalism like never before in history. And it's frightening. And you should be frightened. Get out and vote. Don't vote with emotion. Vote with conviction. Vote with your mind. Vote with how are they going to help the country? What have they done lately? <laughs> anyway guys thank you for joining me if you made it this far and have a blessed day thank you